Today's subject is the Shema, and it's one of those subjects that I find really fascinating because everyone really knows what it is, and yet, because, ironically, the more you know about it, then the more deeply ingrained it is, counterintuitively, the more we kind of, it kind of settles to the background, the more we maybe forget about it, or it it becomes uh, secondary in our focus and our consciousness. So what I want to do today is to take a look, of course, the subject of Shema is a very large one. It's a very fundamental one. It's one of the pillars of Jewish practice, of Jewish belief, of, of Jewish life. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about. But I want to kind of dip our toe in it and try to find uh, a new vista into making the Shema more meaningful and really tapping in and recognizing its, its power. So the Shema, broadly speaking, is a prayer that we say multiple times a day. It's a prayer that consists of three Torah sections. Uh, the first one of them is from Deuteronomy, from Devarim, chapter 6. That's the one that begins with a Shema. The next chapter, the next paragraph begins with Vahayim Shemoa. Shemoa. It should be when you, uh, will you, when you will hear. And that's from Deuteronomy 11. And finally, there's the third paragraph, which, which is from the book of Numbers, chapter 15. We say twice a day, and it's sort of unique, because it's one of the only instructions that we have in Jewish life that is to say something. You know, you have a lot of things to do something, to believe something, to refrain from doing things. Here it's, it's very unique that it's almost like a declaration that is mandatory. Not only is it mandatory, twice a day, in the morning and at night, when you're traveling, when you wake up. It's, it's a very interesting practice that we don't really find many examples. It's not like, oh, there's all these things you need to say. It's really the only thing that is this mantra or this 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 declaration, this pledge of allegiance that we need to say. And it's kind of unique, I think, on, on that account. Moreover, the centrality of the Shema really cannot be overstated. Talmud tells us, a child learns how to speak the first thing you teach them is two verses in the Torah. One verse from the beginning of Deuteronomy, Shema Yisrael, Hashem HaKen Hashem Echad, six words. And another verse from the end of Deuteronomy, Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe Morasha Kilat Yaakov. Torah was given to us by Moshe. It is the heritage of the congregation of Israel. Like, these are the first things. And, and, and the commentaries explain that when, when the child is beginning to speak, it's a very foundational, nascent stage in their development. And therefore, it's right away, right when the door opens, you you have to kind of stick this idea in. It's so important. It's so fundamental. It's the first thing the child learns is the Shema. Well, what's the last thing that the Jew says before they die? It's also the Shema. It's almost like what our sages are telling us is that a Jewish life is bookended by a Shema at the beginning, a Shema at the end, and every day, multiple times in the interim. Clearly, there's something very critical and very crucial and very fundamental to Jewish life found in the Shema. I want to share a few stories to kind of illustrate this point. Uh, the first one is a well-known story, but I think it's a powerful one nonetheless. Uh, this past year, I was invited by a congregation in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, to come give a series of talks at. And the congregation is called Kesher Israel. And this congregation, a hundred years ago, had the most famous, well, one of the most famous rabbis in America, Rabbi Eliezer Silver, was its rabbi. And there's a very famous story about him. After the Holocaust, after the World War II was over, he joined the U.S. military. And he went to, to Europe. And he took with him a group of strapping Marines. And they went on a, a journey throughout the major cities in Europe. And every city that they arrived at, they would go to the monastery. And as we know, parents of Jewish children were faced with the most horrific decision during those terrible times what to do with your child. Keep him with you. Who knows if they'll make it? Give him to the Christian monastery. They'll watch him. They'll be okay. But what's going to be with their Judaism? And we know many Jewish children were actually given over to the monasteries for safekeeping. 
Comes along, the war is over. Let's get those kids back, right? You walk into the monastery. Jewish children? <laughs> what are you talking about? There's no Jewish children here. So what Rabbi Eliezer Silva would do, he would come in with the big Marines, and he would march up and down during bedtime. And he would say the Shema. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkein Hashem Achad. And then the kids instinctively would cover their eyes. <laughs> and every kid that covers their eyes, he picked them up. It's almost like it became, became so deeply ingrained into the essence of the Jewish soul from a very young age that that's kind of like almost the identity of the Jew. I'll share with you another story kind of on the other side. In 2006, there was a war in northern Israel with Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization that runs most of southern Lebanon. And uh, this was in the summer of 2006. And they were sending rockets indiscriminately, as terrorists do, into civilian centers. So you had a you had a million Israelis, incidentally Jews and non-Jews alike, that had to flee and become refugees from their homes in northern Israel because the, the cities were uh, fair game to the terrorists. So the Israeli army, of course, they went in and they tried to kind of uproot the terrorist infrastructure in Lebanon. And as we know, wars are very terrible things. You know, it's really terrible. You send these young men and women into into danger. But it's also a time of unity, a time of inspiration, a time of kind of national coming together. People put away their squabbles and they unite behind the common goal, the common mission. And there was one soldier, his name was Roe Klein. And he was deep into Lebanon uh, and they were fighting uh, in uh, in a uh, in an urban environment, uh, and they go into like the terrorist hotbeds, and they try to root it out, and it's danger on every side, and they were kind of in an alley behind next to some building, and someone threw a grenade amongst a group a cadre of soldiers. So this hero, Roy Klein, he was, I think, a, a, a colonel. He jumped in the grenade. And then he screamed on top of his lungs, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elkein Hashem Echad, and he exploded, and he saved all his friends. And this story kind of shook up the entire, like, the entire country was like talking about it. It was like a moment of, 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 of reckoning for the, for the entire country. And as an aside, my my older brother, my oldest brother, he was like he was so shaken up by the story. He's like, we we have to do something about this. We have to do something about this. The whole country is 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 moved by this story. We have to find a way to capitalize on it. So, this is the only time I've committed such an act of vandalism, as you'll hear. My brother says to me, "Okay, we have to make some sort of permanent <laughs> monument to this great hero and this amazing story." So I was in yeshiva in Israel at the time. He comes to we come, he comes picks me up from yeshiva. It's uh, around midnight, midnight to one o'clock in the morning, and he has with him a a bucket of paint and a broom and a ladder. What are you going to do with a bucket of paint and a broom and a ladder? You'll find out. <laughs> so I, I hop in the car, and he's like, "We're going to do something." like the world's never seen before. Like certainly Jerusalem's never seen before. This is, remember, this is the midst of a war. But I mean, the war has happened in northern Israel. Like Jerusalem is safe. Jerusalem is absorbing hundreds of thousands of refugees for this for this conflict. So we travel to um, Har HaMenuchot, which if you know Jerusalem, right when you enter Jerusalem, there's like uh, all these hills that you're ascending. And one of those hills, right on the outskirts of Jerusalem, is called Har Menuchot, which is essentially the largest graveyard, largest cemetery in Israel. It's got about a million, uh, a million graves. But it's built in a mountain. So how do you build it in a mountain? You can, how do you put a grave in a mountain? What they do is they, they flatten it and then they, they have a, they kind of turn it into these steps so that you have like a, a, a section of graves and then you have like a, like the wall of the, uh, like the facade of the, of the mountain, and it goes up to the next section. It's kind of built, uh, uh, it's built in that way. So you have these vast, enormous 
walls of concrete that 500,000 drivers a day were driving to Jerusalem. The whole drive is you just see this mountain in front of you. And they're driving into Jerusalem. And it's just empty concrete mountain. So here's the plan. We get into the cemetery. The guard at the entrance of the cemetery like, uh, what's all this paraphernalia? Well, we just finished painting. Again, I said, I'm not so proud of this, but just, this is a true story. <laughs> this is a true story. We found a spot... It was located overlooking the Jerusalem Tel Aviv Highway. This is the main highway in Israel. And you're driving, again, if you've been to Jerusalem, you know, you're driving, as you approach the city, there's these mountains in front of you. And then there's this stretch. It's like a mile-long stretch where all you're doing is seeing the concrete of Haram Menuchos, of, 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 of this mountain. We found an overhang. We put the ladder on the overhang, and we wrote in like 10-foot letters the words Shema Yisrael. And for years afterwards, every time I drive to, to, through, through the city or leave a city, it's like incredible that you, you just drive and you see this amazing – it's like you can see from miles away this incredible sign, Shema Yisrael. And again, I, I only admitted it publicly like a year later, like a decade later. I don't want them to come, come after me. The postscript of the story is that – the poster of the story is that about 10 years later, some guy must have been so frustrated with it. Every day he has to see the sign. He, someone someone else, I don't know who it is, but so they took white paint, which we did in white paint, and they just covered the whole thing in white paint. They didn't like, this was, again, this is empty concrete. It was like, there's nothing there, just plain concrete, and they just covered it with uh, with white paint. That's the post script. But I always find like, that that story, such a powerful evocative example of the fact that really that's how a Jewish life ends. Again, with the same declaration that it really began. Uh, and our sages point out that if you look at the first paragraph of the Shema, it actually has hints at all of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, which we know are a condensed encapsulation of Jewish faith, they're included in the Shema. And that's pointed out already in the Talmud. It's ancient. And the Talmud also points out that if you count the words of the Shema from the beginning to the end, you'll end up with 248 words, which is a very significant number because the amount of mitzvos that are instructions, that are positive mitzvos in the Torah, 248 as well. And again, the sages point this out to say there's something here that really is representative, is emblematic, that personifies in the Shema all of Torah. And then I found the Rambam. As we know, the Rambam called, of course, in English, Maimonides, Rabbi Moshe, the son of Maimon. He lived, he was born in Spain and he actually emigrated to Egypt when he was a young man. And he lived there till he passed away. So his years are 1135 to 1204. And he wrote, of course, some of the monumental magisterial works of Jewish literature. For example, the Rambam, he was a teenager when he wrote the first full commentary on all of Mishnah. Again, the Mishnah was around for a thousand years, 63 books of Jewish law. No one was able to write a commentary. The Rambam, he's a teenager, he does it. He systematizes and organizes and classifies and structurizes all of Jewish law. But of course, his other major work is the Mora Nevuchim, the Guide to the Perplexed. And till this day, it's one of the greatest representations of Jewish philosophy that we have. In fact, the Rama in his, in his day was not only the greatest Torah scholar and the greatest halachist, he was also the greatest philosopher of his age and incidentally, the greatest physician of his time. When Richard the Lionheart was leading the Crusades to Jerusalem, he heard about Maimonides. He went to visit him and he tried to convince him to come back to England to be his personal physician in England, which is kind of interesting. Like this, in an alternative universe, the Rambam wrote a lot of his works in Arabic because that was the lingua franca of the place where he lived. If the Rambam would have accepted Richard Lionheart's offer, who knows? Maybe we would have some of his writings in English. 
but anyhow, he didn't. So he writes this incredible work of Jewish philosophy, which is essentially trying to explain everything about Judaism via the prism of the prevailing philosophy of the time, namely Greek philosophy. So everything in Judaism is going to explain in a way that resonates with the Greek philosophers of the time. And he has this stunning passage about the Shema. And it's stunning because if it, if I tell it to you, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But then we kind of dig in like, really? Is he really suggesting that? I want to read you what he says. He's talking to the, talking to the reader. He's telling him, you know, if you want to do what the Torah wants of you, if you want to kind of get the message contained within it, this is the first thing that you should do. What's the first and so first step of this journey? The first step is that you should concentrate, clear out your mind from any distractions when you say the Shema. That's the first step on the road, on the journey towards achieving what the Torah wants of you. Moreover, when you, he says, how should, you, how long should you work on that? How long should you dwell on the first step and the first stage of this journey to greatness? You should spend many years doing that. Many years you should concentrate your spiritual energy towards the Shema. There's two amazing points here. Number one, it's the first step of a journey to greatness. Number two, it's a step that you should dwell upon, that you should focus on for many years. I was thinking, do you have the Shema? The Shema, the sentence the Shema is literally six words. And even if you say the Ramam is referring to the entire Shema, 248 words, and words that I could say by heart. Why is he advising us to focus on it, to concentrate on it for many years? How complicated could the Shema already be? It's so difficult that you have to concentrate on it for many years? Seems kind of odd. And I think the, I think the answer is that the Ramam is not telling us to focus on the ideas of the Shema. Of course, you have to focus on the ideas, but it's not just knowing those ideas. It's trying to assimilate those ideas into your life. It's trying to incorporate those ideas into your life. It's trying to integrate those ideas into how you see the world. It's a worldview of Elton Shang that is comprehensive, that involves every aspect of your life. It's family the Shema. And of course, to study the ideas of the Shema, we could do it right now. We could list it, no problem. There's this idea, that idea, that idea, boom, we got it. That's not what he's advising us. He's advising us to absorb the message to the degree that we start living by those ideals, that we start adopting those principles, that we start focusing on the world differently, seeing the world via the lens of the Shema. There's, there's, a, there's an attitude found in the Shema that is usable, that is, that, that is profound and can be applied to every life situation. So what I want to do today is I want to suggest an approach for how, for what the idea or what one of those ideas in the Shema is and to see a little bit how it, it, it permeates every area of our life. And I want to begin with a parable, with a story that is found in ancient Jewish literature that really I think, gives us a complete picture of what the Shema is trying to impress upon us. So the story goes that there was a man who had a family, and the family was destitute, and the family was really poor, and they were suffering, and nothing that he was doing was yielding success. But he found out that in some far, far away place, maybe a a year's journey away, there is a country, it's an island, that is filled with wealth. Its its streets are paved with gold. There are diamonds aplenty. There is robust wealth to be had very easily. But the problem is it's a very long journey. And it's a very perilous one. And the transportation 
only comes every couple of years. So once you go, you got to stay there for a while. So after consultation with his wife and his community, he says, you know what? I'm going to go there. I'll spend a couple of years there. I'll amass tremendous wealth. I'll bring it back here. I'll be able to enjoy it. That's the plan. Everyone agrees. He sets off on the journey. It's a long trip. He's got to go over land and mountains and valleys and everything through very perilous navigation. Finally, they arrive at this island. And he gets off the island and he can't believe what his eyes see. Wealth and riches and gems and gold and diamonds as far as the eye could see. Wherever you go, it's available. He brought with him, with him some bags, some big sacks, and he like he jumps off the ship and starts stockpiling. He starts filling up his bags. Oh, this is it. This is this is what I came for, right? And he's there and he's filling a bag, right? And then someone comes over to him and says, What are you doing? We said, What do you mean? And there's there's all these diamonds here. He's like, no, 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 you're you're like picking up dirt. What are you what are you what are you saving the dirt for? Who does that? Who goes and just lifts up soil and tries to, you know, wood chips? What, why are you doing that? He says, well, it's val- it's valuable. This is this is nothing. This is what we value here. And he tells them, we value something else. We value the pits of dried fruits. That's that's what's important here. What are you doing here? Everyone starts mocking him. And he's like, oh, okay. So he empties out his bags and he starts filling it up with other things, the things that are much more rare there, right? The, uh, all these very valuable in his eyes, the very valuable pits of these dried fruits. And he's working very hard and they have to try to dig, you know, dig over here, mine and, and find from the trees. And they're working, looking in caves. Everyone's trying to find this precious commodity in this island. And uh, after two two years, he has like a nice full bag of it. And he's proud of his accomplishments. And then he hears the siren. Okay, it's time to go back home. Amazing. He's so excited. He was, can't wait to show his family what he got. It's time to go back home. He gets on the ship. He's so excited. What a productive two years. And after, again, a very long, perilous journey, he ends up back home. His family's so excited to see him. The kids are so much bigger. He can't believe it. Everyone's jumping, hugging, such joy. So afterwards, you know, after the thing settled down, so I said, okay, where is it? I got it. I got it. Don't worry. I got tremendous. He goes to his bag and his wife opens it. She's like, this is what you brought me back? This is what, what were you doing all the time? What were you wasting your time? He's like, well, they told me this was really valuable. They told me that this is what, what I should pursue. Look how much I got. She tells him, this is useless. What am I going to do with this? She shakes it out and she finds in the bottom. It's one diamond. And then she looks in his pen cuffs and she finds another one there. She finds one here. And, and yes, it's, it's tremendously valuable, but she's like, you have such an opportunity to do so much more and you focus on all the other things. That's the parable found in ancient Jewish sources. And the lesson, of course, is obvious. We, our souls, originate from heaven. That's our homeland. That's where we're from. That's where we originate from. We're sent here on a mission. We're sent here because here there's something that's plentiful that's not found there. And you know what that is? That, that's mitzvahs. And each mitzvah is a diamond viewed in the lenses of heaven. It's tremendously valuable. And it's here. It's available wherever you go. The, the place is replete with opportunities to do mitzvahs. It's, it's, it's burgeoning. It's the, the place where it is engorged with mitzvahs. Wherever you go, as far as the eye can see, is mitzvahs. Diamonds. We get here, and our soul is maybe a little bit naive. And maybe we have some sort of inclinations to pursue mitzvahs. We get here, and everyone tells us, no, 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 no. There's other things you got to focus on. There's all these other important things you have to try to stockpile before you go back home. And we kind of take our bag, take our satchel, take our sack, empty it out, and start focusing on stockpiling all those other things. And we spend our whole life, and at the end of the life, we, we have it, right? We, we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish. We go back home. We go back to our land of origin. 
our soul returns home. I can't believe what happened. I sent you to the land of opportunity. I sent you to the land of gold, silver, diamonds, jewels, pre- everything. The land of unprecedented wealth. And this is what you brought back me and you shake it out and you find, whoa, there's one mitzvah, one diamond, two, three, five. But there's so much more opportunities. That is, I would say, presented as, as an encapsulation of Jewish life kind of more broadly, but also about what the Torah is trying to get at us and, and certainly what is epitomized by the Shema. What is the, how does the Shema begin? Shema. Listen. Wake up. What are you doing? Where are you from? Where do you originate? We start with God. God is one, right? We're trying to remember the fact that there's a spiritual component to life as well. Remember, you were there. You know this information. Remember, don't get sidetracked. Thank you. Don't get sidetracked with all the, uh, with, with all the distractions. Focus on what you're really here for. Remember what you're living for. Don't forget what it's all about. Shema, listen, listen, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. And we say this multiple times in, and our sages tell us. Every single day, you gotta say it in the morning and at night. Essentially, when our traveler travels to the land of wealth and opportunity, he knew ahead of time that there's a very high likelihood that to the same degree of opportunity is found in this land of opportunity is the degree of distractions. There's so much wealth, but there is almost a a, a, um, a magnetic drive away from that wealth. And every day is told in the morning when you wake up, right when you wake up, right when you wake up, make a declaration that will keep you in track. At night, you go to sleep. Again, declare this. Declare what you're here for. Declare, declare what you live for. Remember, remember, get the message home. And what are some of the themes that we see in the Shema? There was a video a couple of uh, months ago going uh, around on the internet of the thing that everyone expects to not happen, but that actually happens. There was a plane. There was, um, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I think one of the windows got uh, punctured or something like that. And they lost the cabin pressure. So, of course, what happens? In the unlikely event of a loss of cabin pressure, when, how does this sentence continue? Oxygen mask will drop in front of you and put it on your nose and mouth. If there's a baby, do yourself first, then the baby. Everyone knows this by heart. Put it on yourself and then put it on the baby, right? And breathe normally. The bag may not inflate, but the oxygen is still flowing, right? And then we have the instructions on what to do in case of a landing on water, how to put on the life jacket and the things, right? Everyone knows, everyone knows this. Everyone knows this. Declare this declaration we get every time we fly. And if it's like, on, you know, disturbs your video, like a uh, announcement, cabin announcement. I know this already. I've seen this a thousand <laughs> times. And then what happens? A few months ago, there was actually a plane that lost its cabin pressure. And there's a video. It's kind of chaotic. It's a very tragic event. There was a woman, one woman that died. I think well, at least one woman that died. And... There's a video someone posted online and everyone's doing it wrong. <laughs> everyone has it just on their mouth. And like how many times have you heard? Cover your nose and mouth and breathe normally. And everyone is doing it wrong. What should we do? How do we fix this problem? So maybe there's a few solutions. But what's clear is that just declaring something, just making a declaration, it's not enough. Because you know what? You can make the declaration. I know this already. Of course, everyone knows what to do in the case of the, the, the unlikely event of a loss of cabin pressure. Everyone knows what to do. Of course, you, and then what happens? Push comes to shove. They don't actually do it. And I was thinking like, every day we're almost on the airplane and every day there's a loss of cabin pressure. Every day we're going to get distracted. We're going to get sidetracked. Every day we're going to stop focusing on the things that are important. And every day we need to be reminded to put it in our nose and mouth. That's the Shema. Remember what you're here for. Every day is a plane crash. No, of course not. But every day is a day where you need to be reminded because every day you have to implement that. Every day you have to make choices. What are you living for? What are you trying to stockpile? What are you going to fill up your satchels with? What do you invest your time in? 
And that, that's the challenge of the Shema. It's so critical, it's so important, so vital, so fundamental. But we have a tendency to say it and to be habitual about it. And it becomes a mantra. You could say it by heart. You could say even backwards by heart. You know, you know it, of course. But do you live it? That's the question. That's what the Ram tells us. He says every day, spend years concentrating on this. Not only does he say to concentrate on the Shema, he says to stop concentrating on anything else. You have to clear your mind because everything else that's there, that's the enemy, so to speak. That's exactly what the Shema is coming to counteract. It's trying to say there are all these other distractions that you have in your life and those are going to counteract the efficacy of the Shema. Clear everything away, say the Shema, remember what you're here for and go live your day. You're done. You've done your day. Say the Shema again. Remember what you're here for and do a calculation. Do a character assessment. How was my day? Did I abide by the tenets of the Shema or did I get, did, did, did I drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, of the world around me? What are some of the themes that come up in the Shema? So, of course, studying Torah. Torah is oriented around keeping your connection with your homeland. The Torah comes from the heaven. Your soul comes from the heaven. The more you connect to that idea, the more you remember really what you're here for. You're here temporarily for a specific mission to go back home and to bring to bring the wealth and the bounty that you're able to stockpile over here. That's what studying Torah is about. You take these ideas, you take the Shema, you put it into a box, a leather box with multiple compartments, and you actually tie it to your head. It's such an unbelievable imagery. We're taking these instructions and these ideals and how much more obvious can we get than take it and literally tie it as a knot onto your head and by your arm. And that's in the Shema. And that's what we do every day. Get the message home. What else can I do? Literally wrapping it, knotting it around your body to try to get the message home. And again, we can just put on the tefillin and I'm guilty as charged. I promise I'm guilty as charged. Put on the tefillin. No problem. I can do it in my sleep. Put my tefillin on, and that's it. Your mind's elsewhere. You're on your on your job, on your family, on on the politics, of course, all kinds of other distractions, and you're not even realizing what you're doing. You're taking a sign to remember what you're here for, and you're literally taking leather straps and connecting it to your heart, heart and your mind to try to evoke this memory. Place them as a sign on your doorposts, every door that you walk through. A thing that we do a thousand times a day, maybe a hundred, I don't know how many times you do it a day. A hundred times a day you do this and every time you're supposed to be a slight reminder. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't forget what you're here for. Don't forget to try to stockpile mitzvahs. That's what you're here for. I had a, um, my Rebbe, my uh, my teacher in Israel, whenever he would pass a mezuzah, so there's a, there's a um, custom to kiss the mezuzah. You've seen that, everyone's seen that, right? Kiss the mezuzah. What he would do is he would touch the mezuzah, and stop for a second. And just, again, recalibrate your mind. Reorient yourself and kind of bring yourself back into mindfulness. What are we here for? Every time you pass the mezuzah, what are we here for? Very valuable exercise. Then we have, of course, the tzitzis, the fringes at the end of your garments. You actually wear in your garment that reminds you of God and what you're here for. The tzitzis, our sages tell us, Correspond to 613. How so? Because the gematria, the numerical value, as we know, every Hebrew letter has a corresponding number. The gematria of the word tzitzis is 600. And if you look at a tzitzis strand, I'll show you here for a demonstration, you'll have five knots plus eight strings. 600 plus five plus eight, 613. You're wearing your garment of 613 mitzvahs. That, that, that's what it's there for. And then what do you do? On the fringes, you put a blue strand. You put a tchela strand. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that before? Mm-hmm. You see the blue strand? Why do we have a blue strand on the corner of our tzitzis? Says the Talmud. Because the blue reminds you of water. And water is reflects the heaven. And heaven will make you think of God's heavenly throne. Ergo, you look at the tzitzis and you remember the mitzvahs. 
Again, remember, 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 when you walk on the doorpost, when you wrap the, when you make the declaration, always remember where you're coming from. Remember heaven. You look at the balloon, you're supposed to say, I, I know where I come from. I come from heaven. And there's streams. And the major says something fascinating. Why do we have streams? It's an interesting thing. There's like a, there's some knots and then there's some streams. Says the Midrash. Fascinating idea. It gives another analogy. It says you have a captain on a ship with some sailors. The captain takes one of the sailors and chucks him overboard. That's not so friendly, right? And the sailor is now overboard and he's flailing about and the, the, the seas are raging. And then what does the captain do? He takes a lifeline and he throws it to the sailor that's drowning overboard. And he tells him, the captain tells the sailor, hold on to the rope, seize onto the lifeline and don't let go of it. And then I'm going to pull you up close to me. I'm going to bring you back to the ship deck. Of course, the lesson is clear here as well. We originate from the ship deck. We originate from on high. We're close to the captain. We're close to God. Our soul, its homeland, is heaven. It was thrown to this world. Yes, it's a world of tremendous opportunities, but it's also a world rife with dangers. If we, if we don't, if we don't maintain our bearings, we're not going to be able to accomplish our mission. But God says, you know what? I'm not leaving you there alone. I'm going to throw you the lifeline. I'm going to throw you the mitzvot, which are represented by the tzitzis. You hold it and you're about to get back here in a way that is successful. Again, we want to get back home the right way. Making the right decision, ending up there in the way that was intended when we initially left. Again, this is a, a very fundamental idea. Our true homeland, our true place of origin is in heaven. That's where our soul is. That's where our soul goes back to after it's separate from the body. So the soul comes from heaven and it returns to heaven. And it spends some time over here. But the time over here determines the state of the soul over there. And these ideas are brought to bear, are we invoked every single day when we say the Shema. Now, just to kind of round out our understanding of the subject, as we mentioned, there are concomitant dangers on the island. What's the danger on the island? The danger is, well, you're going to forget what you're doing. You're going to forget what your mission is. You're going to get there. You you think maybe initially that you're just going to focus on what you're really there for. But the truth is, once you get there, it's quite likely almost guaranteed that when you get there, you're going to be, your mind is going to be redirected elsewhere and you're going to focus on other things. You're, the, the true nature of your mission is going to be distorted. It's going to be obfuscated. It's going to be covered. You're going to be pushed elsewhere. There is a name in Jewish literature for the force, for the entity that redirects our focus and that is called Yetzer Hara, or Yetzahara, as they say in uh, in uh, in Yiddish. Yetzer Hara, that is it literally means evil inclination. That is the force that its job, its goal is when you get to the island. It's to make you lose track of what you're there for. In the analogy of the sailor overboard. The water, the raging water, the danger, that's a reference for the Yitzhara. Now, of course, the Yitzhara is a big subject in Jewish literature, but the Talmud tells us something very interesting. The Talmud gives a, a description of the Yitzhara that sounds very odd. You know, if you would think of the Yitzhara, it's the devil, it's Satan, it's the angel of death. Right? That, that's what we would think. And there are a lot of those descriptors. There's about 10 or so different descriptions in the Talmud about what the Yitzhara is. Because it's defining different dimensions, different aspects of its operation. But the Talmud tells us, the book of Brachos, page 17a, a definition of the Yitzhara, that it is the yeast in the bread, or yeast in the dough. Se'or Shebi'isa. Yeast in the dough. 
Now, I can think of a lot of ways to describe the Yitzhara. <laughs> Very low on the list would be an agent that makes dough rise. What is the meaning behind this very unusual, maybe even bizarre description of the Eight Sahara? So our sages explain that what happens if you don't put yeast in the dough? Could you still make bread? Sort of. It's not very good. But it, yeah, it's, it's flat, exactly. And in fact, there's a, there's a whole holiday it's oriented around these, these different breads. There's this kind of bread, which is really bad, and this kind of bread, which is really, really good. And they're almost identical, really, on a molecular level. There's flour, water. That makes bread. The only difference is, is the yeast, allowing a time for it, for it to rise, for it to get. And to us, we're like, we want the bread. Matzah is insanely expensive crackers. <laughs> <laughs> that taste like sawdust. <laughs> And yet, you know, someone once made a calculation. He, he's like, matzah is so expensive and he got the expensive matzah. He's like, I calculated it was 35 cents a bite. <laughs> he, was, he was on a bite level, how expensive it was. Oh, yeah. Butter is cheap compared to the matzah. So there's a whole holiday oriented around this contrast between this kind of bread versus that kind of bread. And to us, it's like, well, we left Egypt really fast. Like, that's what the Haggadah says. But all the commentaries make this connection is that this is a seven uh, day festival that's oriented around, again, re- revisiting this message. We're revisiting the message of what are we here for? Right? We're here to work, to stockpile, to prepare ourselves for a trip back home. The Yetzara says, no, no, no. You, you need to, fo- you, you, you got to make the bread. You gotta sit, sit down, you gotta enjoy, you gotta focus on the island, not the homeland. If someone wants nutrition, you need nutrition, of course, but all you need is matzah. If, if, if your entire goal was just to fuel your journey back home, matzah would be perfect. Comes along the Yetzirah, right? it injects the yeast in the dough. It says, no, 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 who wants the matzah? It's flat, it's disgusting, it doesn't taste good. It's not, it's not an experience. We have to make an experience out of this. She so says, okay, let's, let's take the bread and let's, let's make it nice and fluffy and pluffy and a really wonderful experience. Now, this is not to, uh, this is not to imply that the sages are telling us that we should avoid bread. No. What it's telling us is this is the essence of what it does to us. What the Israel does to us. We're here on a journey. We need fuel for our journey, but our, we have a, we have a mission. So we need to eat something. We have to tend to our bodies, so to speak. We have to live as an islander, but we can't forget our homeland. But our focus should not be testing all the resorts. And again, we're here for a mission. So you, the matzah is enough for the mission. The bread, well, that's when you want to experience what it's like to live as an islander. That's what the Yitzhara does. All he does is changes the nature of living life for that year or two and for our examples for 90, 100 years to change the essence, the nature of that life to be one of consumption versus one of preparation. The real goal is to, again, prepare, prepare, get those stockpiles and bring it back home. Yes, you need fuel for the journey, sure, but your goal is to prepare. Yetzirah says, no, there's the yeast and the bread. It's not a time of preparation, it's time of consumption. And therefore, if you're consuming, you don't want to eat matzah. Matzah is disgusting. Well, some people really like it. I know someone who eats matzah throughout, throughout the year. He saves the matzah, buys the matzah after Pesach when it's cheap. It's like, it's like getting the, it's, it's, it's getting the, uh, yes, or the, uh, or Valentine's Day can, uh, cookies or whatever. They're all on sale now. So he, he buys the matzah after Pesach. He's the only guy who buys matzah after Pesach that I know. And then he heats it up. Oh, it's so delicious. Matzah every day. So there are some people like that. But again, for consumption purposes, you want the bread. And that very sharp example, again, is expressed in every area of our life. Are we preparing? Are we consuming? Are we optimizing for life on the island or optimizing for life back home? That's the question. And the Shema reminds us, you're here to prepare. Don't forget about God. Don't forget about where you come from. Don't forget the mitzvahs. Don't forget what you're here for. And I would say more broadly, that's really what all of Torah is. That's why the Shema is 
symbolic of all of Torah. And just to complete that thought, we have literally a seven-day holiday that the focus is on this point precisely. You eat the matzah, you don't eat the bread, and again, recalibrate what you're living for. Don't get caught up in the eight Sahara's chicanery. Don't buy his smoke screen. Don't forget you're here to prepare for, for your trip back home. Seven days in the spring. Then we have seven days in the fall. The sukkah. What do we do? What, what, what do Jews do right when it gets cold? I know in Houston it doesn't, that's so cold. But I'm from the, I'm from the Northeast. And then every, and my wife's from Canada. So by the time sukkah comes along, it's frigid. And what do, what do Jews do when it starts getting cold? You know what? I have a brilliant idea. Let's leave our climate controlled homes. <laughs> and go sit in a temporary booth. In 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 a, in a in a in a teepee, outside, with bundles and bundles, and it was subject to the rain and subject to the snow and subject to the mosquitoes, and this is what we think makes sense. That's our brilliant idea. <laughs> and again, it's exactly six months from Pesach, and the idea is, what do you do? You leave your permanent home, and you move into a temporary home. Again. Permanent, temporary, Consum- consumption, preparation. If you're preparing, well, then you're there temporarily till you're finished preparing. You know, our, our shul is undergoing construction now uh, in the young, young Israel in, in Houston. So if you've been there, it's, it's very odd. The entire building is not a single bathroom. How do you have a shul without a bathroom? Well, you go outside. And there's a, uh, what's that called? Porta-potty. There's a porta potty. <laughs> now everyone tells me, no, 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 no. It's a very plush porta potty. <laughs> it's a very, I'm like, how do you have a plush port? So you go in there, it's kind of like, it looks actually kind of nice. Mm-hmm. Right? You've been there? Nice it's not bad, right? It, it, lo- it looks like, um, uh, like, a, like an RV somewhat, like, a, like an RV that would hook up to a car. Okay. And it's got, uh, electricity and it's got air conditioning. It's got running water. Now, actually, it's, 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 it, 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 I didn't find it that it smelled at all. I'm like, wow. I, but it's still, you tell someone, like, the shul has a temporary... Well, what does that mean? It means that, well, when you're building, when you're doing construction, you're preparing. When you're preparing, you're willing to put up... It's temporary. It's, this, it's not going to be like this forever. No, no one would go for that, even if it was a plush bathroom, plush porta potty But because you realize that this is a year of construction, of preparation, a year of working towards the goal, well, then, of course, it's temporary. No one would go for it if it was permanent. If they suggested, hey, we really like these plush, well, we don't, we just, we could have more space for the kids programming in the shul without the bathrooms. No one would go for that. But if it's temporary, then you would. What do we do? We leave our house. We leave our permanent house and we move into a temporary house. What are we trying to remember? Well, what message are we trying to absorb? Again, that really... Your permanent house and your temporary house, they're all temporary. Because you're here on the island, you're here on this, on this planet, you're here for 70, 80, 90, 100. If they really figure out the health, maybe 150 years. And our sages tell us, even if you live a thousand years, it's still varying degrees of temporality. It's still temporary. You leave your permanent home, you move into a temporary home, remember, temporary, you're here to produce, to prepare. Not to consume. Again, seven seven days here, seven days there. Remember this message, the message we find in the Shema. And just to uh, finish off this point, our sages tell us that there's four tactics. There's four tactics. If someone wants to combat their Yetzara, if someone wants to neutralize the Yetzara, there's four tactics that they could adopt that will be, uh, that will work, that will, that will succeed in neutralizing the Yetzara. And it says, number one, to struggle with it, to combat it. Number two, to study Torah. Like we said, study Torah connects you back to your homeland. Number three, to recite the Shema. The Shema, again, reminds us of where we came from. Reminds us what we're living for. Reminds us about our role as preparers, as stockpilers, not as consumers. And finally, 
says the Talmud, what is the last way to really remember where you come from, where you're going to? Remember the day of death. It's a very powerful exercise. Our sages tell us when you remember the fact that you will die, it's okay, everyone dies. And even though you know that, when you remember it, it once again puts life into context. It puts things back into perspective. I'm here temporarily. Yes, 70 years. Yes, we don't think about it all the time and it's probably not healthy to think about it all the time. But every once in a while, it's important for you to remember this fact because like the guy who goes on the trip to the island, there's maybe an announcement. Okay, in a month, the ship is going back. And that will maybe remind him, oh, I'm not here forever. I have to try to think about what I need to do to prepare for my true homeland. I want to conclude with a very powerful episode of someone who actually absorbed the message of the Shema to a astonishing degree. And this is told in the Talmud, in the book of Brachos, page 61a. And it's told about one of the greatest heroes of our history, Rabbi Akiva. He lived in the first and the second century of the Common Era. And at the end of his life, he was a very old man already, a venerated sage. And the Romans, they instituted a policy of tremendous persecution of the Jews. And this, of course, happened several times, but it happened, uh, it reached a uh, uh, its, its pinnacle about the year 130 or so. The emperor's name was Hadrian. And though, although Hadrian began his tenure as emperor somewhat conciliatorily towards the Jews, he eventually became like Antiochus, like the Greeks, and he instituted very crippling decrees against Torah study and against uh, Torah practice. Uh, for example, just to show the degree of heinousness and brutality, the Romans decreed if any child is circumcised, the child, the offending child, eight-day-year-old child, and the mother will be thrown off a cliff. A horrific, brutal, amongst a, a, degree, a, a, a litany of other anti-Jewish practices. So, Rabbi Kiva was a very old sage at the time. And there was a rule, again, pla- placards everywhere, teach Torah, study Torah publicly, you're going to be executed. Rabbi Akiva said, I'm studying Torah nonetheless. And he gathered all the students, as if nothing happened. So an individual that was present, his name was Papas, the son of Yehuda, according to our sages in the Talmud, he says, to him, Rabbi Akiva, are you nuts? Don't you know these Romans, they don't, they don't play games? They don't believe in... Uh, humane treatment of offenders. These people are animals. What are you doing? You gambling with people studying Torah? They're going to kill you. What are you doing? So he responds to him. He says, well, yes, they may kill me if I teach him Torah. But what's going to happen if I don't teach Torah? I'm dead anyhow. I'm functionally dead because a Jew without Torah is like a Jew with, it's like a fish without, uh, without water. And he gives him the f- famous analogy. He says, well, there was a fish that was dodging the nets of the fishermen. And the fox tells the fish, this is again an analogy, the fox tells the fish, why are you so dodgy? Why are you evading so many things? He says, well, the fish, fishermen, they strung out the nets to try to trap me. And I want to avoid them. And therefore, I'm trying to go at the edges. He says, well, I have a solution. Why don't you come on land? Come on land. There's not a single fisherman as far as the eye can see. There's no nets anywhere. You're safe. So the fish responds to the fox. Are you the cleverest of animals? You're a fool. Here, in the water where I have life, there's danger. But outside the water, I have no life at all. Rabbi Kiva tells his detractors, in the water, in Torah, I have life. Yes, it's dangerous. I got to avoid the nets. But outside of the water, outside of Torah, I don't have any life at all. So eventually, the time came, Rabbi Kiva was arrested. 
He was actually incarcerated for some time. Uh, there are some stories we're told about him, how he, again, he's the greatest sage of them all, and he's in a Roman prison, and there's a halachic query that his students have, but they can't go visit him. He didn't have visiting hours. So they would holler into his cell, and he would holler back and give them the answers. Very fascinating. Regardless, the Romans eventually decided to publicly execute Rabbi Tiva for his crime. And they did it in a very uh, heinous and brutal fashion. They took iron combs and they flayed him alive. Terrible, 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 terrible brutality. And Rabbi Tiva's stoic. He doesn't say anything until he starts saying the Shema. And his students asked him, Rebbe, our teacher, even now you're saying the Shema? Why are you saying the Shema now? And he responds to them in the most unusual fashion. He says, well, every single day that I said the Shema, I was sad. Because what do we say in the Shema? First we invoke the idea of God. Hashem al Hashem achad. And then we say, Ve'ahavta, you shall love Hashem your God, Bechol with all your hearts, Bechol with all your soul, Bechol Modech with all your resources. You have to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your resources. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love God with all your with all your soul? It means even if God takes away your soul, you have to love God. Essentially, when we say Shema, we're dedicating our hearts, our, our souls, our lives to God. If God takes away our soul, we have, to, we have to love Him nonetheless. Every time, says Rabbi Kiva, every time I said the Shema, I was disappointed. I said, When will I finally have the opportunity to give up my life for God? Every day I said the Shema, I was sad because I could not be executed for God. Because I cannot die in martyrdom. I cannot forfeit my life for God. And now, I finally have the opportunity to die for God. I'm not going to say the Shema. Now I can finally say the Shema with true joy to know that I'm actually abiding by my pledge to love God with all my soul. And the Talmud continues, as Rabbi Akiva got to the word Echad, the last of the sentences of the Shema, his soul departed from him. And the postscript of the story is that the angels said, oh, there was a booming prophetic voice, praiseworthy are you Rabbi Akiva whose soul departed with the word Echad. And again, a second Prophetic voice announced, Praiseworthy Rabbi Kiva, you are welcomed to the afterlife. And I think it's an interesting story on many fronts. But I think what I find most fascinating is Rabbi Kiva, every day when he said the Shema, it's a regular Tuesday, there's no dangers. It's before the draconian edicts of the Romans. Every single day he says the Shema and he's sad. Why? Because he wants to die for God. Fascinating. For us, let's say we believe. Someone puts a gun to your head and says, okay, do idolatry. Will you die for God or not? So let's say you believe that you would. But even if you believe that you would, and even if you would, we're hoping to not have to make that choice. We're hoping to have to be able to, you know, die at an old age and, uh, you know, with good health, surrounded by family of natural causes. Remember, he was the opposite. When he says the Shema, he says, I want to actualize this. I want to be able to implement this. And he was sad that he didn't have a chance to die for God. Rabbi Tiva, in the words of Maimonides, right? He, he's lived a life where every day he's really concentrated on the Shema. Not just on the words of the Shema, but the meaning of the Shema. And in his mind, the only world that really matters is heaven. And the best thing that you could do here is prime yourself and prepare yourself, stockpile those proverbial diamonds for your trip back home. What is the greatest thing that someone could do? What is the greatest commitment, investment that someone could do to be able to better facilitate their trip back home? What's the best way to prepare for life as a soul in heaven? To actually give up everything for God. When someone like Rabbi Kiva, of course, I'm not suggesting that we're not, we're not going to reach this level of Rabbi Kiva, but I think it's important, at least on an intellectual level, to realize that he spent not just some time learning about the Shema, he actually lived it. And therefore, to the degree that every day he was pining 
to actually die for God. He had an upsurge, a swell. The declaration wasn't just this monotonous, habitual, routine declaration, this, these words that you say with bereft of meaning. No, he actually lived them. And he says, how can I do it? Oh, I feel terrible that I don't have an opportunity to die for God. That's at the furthest extreme. But I think uh, regardless, that it's a very powerful lesson for us that the Shema that we have every day is really an opportunity to ask ourselves the question, what are we living for? In the morning, what should we be living for? In the evening, what are we living for? What do we do today? And every day have this touch point with this fact that we are really here temporarily. We are sojourners. We are visitors here. Our true homeland is in heaven and we have a mission here and our mission is to stockpile those diamonds. We think about the Shema, the words of the Shema, all the mitzvahs there that are, again, reminder, 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 remember, remember, don't forget. Remember where we came from. Remember where we're going to and live our lives accordingly. That's the power of the Shema. And hopefully, by studying about it, our Shema that we say every day will be more meaningful, more powerful, and more evocative.